If you look at your bulletins on page two, you will see that there's a new vision statement and a mission statement. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on that, but I want you to know that the passage that we just read today has much to do with our vision. A people being renewed by the goodness, beauty, and truth of God in Jesus Christ. By the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. A people being renewed by the goodness, beauty, and truth of God in Jesus Christ. Not by our own works or our own efforts, no. We're being renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I hope that renewing process continues this morning. God is a good God, and He deserves to be praised and worshipped not only once a week collectively as a group, but every second of every living hour that we have. God is so good. God is awesome. He is wonderful. He deserves the highest of praises. There is no rival, no one in contention. All fall short. God is a good God. And we see that goodness today in the gospel text in Mark. But before we get there, I had a conversation with someone this past week. And he asked me, what do you do? And I told him, I'm a priest. I pastor a church. And then as we began talking, and he probed a little bit, and he said, why? How did you come to this place in your life? And I explained to him. But fundamentally, I said, I fell in love with God. His word. It set me free. He took a moment, paused, and he turned to me and he said something that I often hear when that kind of conversation is had. He said, whatever rocks your boat, whatever works for you, hey, more power to you. I hear that almost with a slight condescension. As if this is just personal preference. As if this is just optional. Not being a priest. No. Falling in love with God. His word. As if that is an optional matter for some people. That's your prerogative. Hey, more power to you. And that's common in our culture. I hear that often. If you sit around people long enough and you have conversations and somehow your faith gets raised in that conversation, some people might actually say something like that to you. Hey, whatever works for you. You know, I'm not here to hate. Have you ever been in a situation or a conversation like that? Have you experienced someone else having that same sort of response to you when your matter of faith and your life and your commitment to Jesus has been raised? The irony in the story or in that particular exchange that I have often with people is that most of those people confess to be Christian. What do I mean by that? Now, I don't know the hearts of men. Neither do you. But the Bible does tell us you will know them by their fruits. I will know if that faith is sincere. That's not a judgment. It's discernment. I'm not casting judgment, but often I find that the people who say to me the most, hey, that's great, whatever works for you. Not for me being a pastor, but really taking my faith seriously. They often be our people who confess to be Jesus, uh, Christians, but who hardly ever step into a church, who oft, hardly ever raise any 
concern about the Christian faith and life. Has that ever happened to you? Do you know such people? It's commonplace, I believe, in our times. This is what our gospel is about today. The context. Jesus is traveling into the holy city of Jerusalem. He has left the region of Galilee, and he's only weeks away from his death. And as the passage begins, it says it begins with saying, and as he was setting out on his journey or his way, his way towards death, his way towards loving the world by laying down his life on his journey that way. That is the context. And remember, there is a messianic secret in the Gospel of Mark, big picture, nobody quite seems to understand, even by chapter 10, who Jesus truly is. People haven't figured out his true identity, and that's at the core of this passage as well. The core of Jesus' identity, again, is being displayed and revealed in this text, but it's being done in such a way that it's indirect. And so when you read this passage, it's easy to misunderstand what is being said. It's almost as powerful and as difficult as those parables that Jesus teaches. It's in that nature, it's in that company of the difficulty of what's being said when it's not being said explicitly. And so when you read a passage like what we just did, and to fully and truly understand it, one needs to take their time. You see, what's in here is very much connected to the Old Testament. In the Gospel that Deacon Diane just read, central to that teaching, that exchange, that experience that Jesus had with this man, fundamentally has to do with the Old Testament. You don't see that at first glance, but it's there. And I've done my best to prepare, meditate, and pray for that to be revealed on earth and received this morning. Jesus is approached by a man, a rich young ruler, as we know. We don't know that he's a rich young ruler only by reading Mark. The synoptic gospels, namely, or meaning, Matthew, Mark, Luke, if you read the parallel passages, they're all three record this passage. That's how we know there's a rich, young ruler speaking to Jesus at this time. Now, who is this man? He's a prosperous man. He's a man of great wealth, of great possessions, and actually in the Greek, property. He owns a lot of property. He's a principled man. He's a man that we learned that he has been, since youth, obeying the commandments of God. At least five through ten. And so he's a principled man man who's got great possessions. He's a personable person. He's someone that isn't afraid to start a conversation with someone. He's an outgoing, he's an extrovert. And he's a spiritual person. He comes to Jesus asking a question about spiritual matters. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he's a prosperous man, he's principled, he's personable, and he's spiritual. It's quite striking when you get to the end of the dialogue, though, you discover that this man's face falls into sadness. Now, when you read the New Testament, often you find people that come to Jesus first sad, and then leave happy. This is the one story that I know of where one comes to Jesus happy 
and leaves sad. It's very unique, very rare. It's exclusive in the sense that here's a man who comes to him what seems to be in a joyful approach attitude, yet leaves sad. Let's look at this man a little closer. You don't amass wealth at a young age. And we only know he's young because of Matthew. If you're not driven, a zealous person. Think about it. In that culture, if you were considered a young, how is it that you have great possessions and property? The kind of person, this man, that is approaching Jesus, he is zealous. He is a go-getter. He is a responsible person, probably hard worker. That's how he's been able to accumulate great wealth and property. He's a man of his word. He's a person that will return your phone calls. That's the kind of character he is. If he says, I will get you that book, he will get you that book. He's the kind of person who will be there on time if he says he will be there. That's the kind of individual we're dealing with here. And that's why it's no surprise that this man comes to Jesus with a spiritual question, asking him, what must I do? He's a man who's a doer. He's a man who gets things done. He's not lazy. He's not slacking off. You're not going to be prosperous at a young age in that culture if you're not driven. Do you see this? Now this helps understand the context and the meaning of this passage. It's not something that's kind of trivial. No. So tell me what to do. What must I do to receive eternal life? I'm pretty good at doing things, getting things done. Let me know. Some of us might have asked that question too. Maybe as recently as this week, this month. What must I do to receive eternal life? He comes before Jesus, kneels. A rich man, young man, kneeling before a teacher. It shows a great deal of respect. Maybe one of the reasons why Jesus loved him. He starts good. There's promise in this man. He's in, his intentions are well, are good. Good teacher, what must I do? Now in Judaism, you never say good teacher. You don't find that in the Talmud. Interpretations of the law. This is very rare. There's no example of it. No Jew in the first century, or even now, would refer to a person, a teacher, as a good teacher. Because all Jews knew that that reference was only ascribed to God. So why is this man calling Jesus good teacher? He's trying to flatter Jesus, I believe. He's trying to impress him, to butter him up. Now what does Jesus say? Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now this passage has troubled many people. What is Jesus saying here? Is he saying he's not good? How do we reconcile that with everything else we know about God and Jesus? It seems like it's a contradiction. Is Jesus saying he's not good? Well, that would go against everything we've learned in Mark thus far. Mark's whole point, much less the New Testament, is to reveal that Jesus is the Son of God. He begins Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3, and he quotes Malachi 3, which reference the Lord. And the word Lord there is the Lord, the divine covenant name of the Lord, Yahweh. 
And the one word that Malachi references, the Lord that you're seeking to come, suddenly will appear to his temple. That word for Lord that Mark references in the first verses of Mark is only used six times in the Septuagint in the Old Testament, in the Masoretic text, and that word is only referenced to God. And Isaiah 43, prepare the way of the Lord. My messenger will come to prepare the way of the Lord. That word Lord is Yahweh. So even from the beginning of Mark, we know Jesus' identity is of deity. He is divine. And you see that throughout, not only in Jesus' identity, but in his prerogatives, Jesus is doing things that only God would do, forgiving sins, namely. So why do I bring this up? Because how could then we understand Jesus' response? Why do you call me good? Is he saying he's not good? No. First, he doesn't respond with a propositional statement. He asks a question. Why do you call me good? That doesn't necessarily mean he's saying he's not good. What he's doing, what he's saying is suitable to this man's ignorance. This man doesn't know what you and I know when we've been following Mark. Because no one, except the demons in Mark, truly understand the identity of Jesus. Except the demons. And we find out at the end, this man truly doesn't know who's standing before him. And so Jesus is just patiently walking with this man's ignorance. He doesn't say, I am not good. Why do you call me good? There is only one who is good, God alone. He's referencing something. It's a teaching moment that will make sense in just minutes. So don't be troubled with this passage. The whole point of Mark is to reveal that Jesus is God and God is good. We wouldn't be able to reconcile everything else in Mark, much less the New Testament, if we interpreted this by Jesus saying, he's not good. The best way of interpreting scripture is by referencing and interpreting scripture, going back to scripture. So, why do you call me good? And this is a passage that some in maybe Islam or some other faiths will say, there you go. Jesus is saying he's not good. So he can't be the son of God. He can't be deity. Because one who has to be good, only God is good, unblemished, with no stain. But Jesus isn't saying he's not good. He's just patiently waiting to reveal something to this man that he does not know. And often, even for us. Remember, no one but the demons know who Jesus is. And this was common for God not to quickly just say, and interrupt and correct and teach a person in their folly. There's many instances in the Old Testament where somebody has a wrong view of the manifestation of God, yet God doesn't correct them at that moment. I'm thinking of Judges 13. Manoah, the father and the wife of Samson, the mother of Samson. The angel of the Lord appears to them They think it's a man of God, not knowing that the angel of the Lord is actually a divine figure, which most likely is Christ manifested in the old. But when they first interact the angel of the Lord, they never figure out who he truly is, and the angel of the Lord doesn't correct them at that moment. That's just one quick example that I'm giving you to make the point that Jesus is not saying he's not good. Okay. Maybe I've exhausted that. So Jesus says, okay. The man says, 
What must I do? Jesus says, fulfill these commandments. And he gives them a list of five commandments. In the Ten Commandments, you have two tables. The first table, the second table. The first table are the first four. And they are the things we owe to God. What Jesus references to this man is the second table, five through ten. Those are the things we owe to fellow man. So strikingly absent in Jesus' response is the things we owe to God. And the man says, I've done them. I've checked those off since my youth. Most people, if you ask them, if you believe in heaven, do you think you will go? Most people will say, I do. And you say, on what basis do you think you'll go to heaven? And I believe most people will give you a response similar to this man's. I do not murder. I do not steal. I do not lie. I honor people. I do not defraud. Most people, we think, are good. We think we are good people. We're not murderers. I just recently heard about a shooting that took place in the evening or this morning in St. Louis, a tragic, senseless, carnage scene where somebody came in and shot and injured multiple people, one dead. And you see this throughout history. You see this recently. You see this as far back as throughout history. And it's easy for us to say, well, we're not them. I don't murder. I don't steal. Like the gentleman I spoke with, he believes that he is inherently good because he's not an extreme violator. He's not a rapist. He's not a murderer. He's not a molester. He's not an abuser. And so in his mind, in many people's mind, we ascribe to ourselves goodness. We're not that bad. And that's what this man is doing. This man is saying, yes, I've done these things since birth. I'm good to my fellow man. I have kept these things since you. Now, despite the meticulous nature of his obedience, it still has not provided him security and rest for his soul. If it did, why would he ask? Why would he ask, how do I go to heaven? Or what must I do to inherit eternal life? He just said he checked off some of the most important things in life. And yet, he still is gut, is at unrest because he doesn't feel secure about his salvation. Which tells us, even in his own disclosure, not knowing what he's just admitted, he's admitted that he himself, by doing all the things of the law, if you will, he is still not secure. He still has no rest for his soul. He doesn't even know what he's admitted. And the thing is, Jesus then says to him, what? You're a man who obeys by the rules. You have, yes, done such things, fulfilled the law in his mind. Although what we know, no one can fulfill the entire law. But Jesus doesn't make that point here. You have broken the first commandment. The man thinks the second table, 5 through 10, is sufficient. But what he doesn't know, what Jesus knows in his heart, is that this man has actually violated the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. This is why I said this passage is central. Its meaning is found in the Old Testament. Because the first commandment given by God to Moses is thou shalt have no other gods but me. But this man has another God. His wealth. 
And that's why Jesus didn't reference the first four. Because he wants to teach this man of his spiritual blindness. The things he owes to God, he has not fully obeyed. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Clearly this young man did not love God in this way. And Jesus in his wisdom puts his finger on the issue in his life. His wealth, his property has blinded him, has fooled him in thinking that he can have confidence in those things. Because we know that by his response. He's not able to let it go. He leaves the place mourning because for him, that is God. He's not willing to let go and lose everything. Because if he truly loved God, he would. If he truly had God as one, Yahweh, God the Father, and seen Jesus as his son, he would have left all things. But the man was not able and willing to let all things go, meaning sell all his possessions, all his property, and follow Jesus. Because if he truly did love God... If he truly had one God, he would. Jesus knows his heart and Jesus knows our heart. Are we willing to leave everything behind? Do we know who Jesus is? Hmm. In our influence, forgive me, affluence, We are tempted to rely on earthly things. This man said, let me know, what do I do? Where do I write the check? How can I get this done? That's how he's thinking. Because he's so used to having things, it's so easy to receive. And that's why the disciples are perplexed. If this man cannot receive eternal life, who's rich, who else can? Who can be saved if this man can't? He can buy anything. He can have anything. And you're saying he can't? So why does Jesus say it's so difficult for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God? Because he, like many of us, rely on the wrong things. Trust in the wrong things. Namely, his goodness. This man did not forfeit eternal life because he was bad. He forfeited eternal life because he was good. In his mind, he was a good man, sufficient. He had fulfilled five through ten. He didn't understand that it's not your goodness that gets you eternal life. That's why Jesus says, it is impossible with man to receive salvation. But with all things, but with God, all things are possible. What does that mean? That means that grace is sufficient. That means that we don't inherit eternal life by the things we do or who we are. That's a false sense of how this works. It's in the grace of God. What this man needed to do is understand and believe in Christ and Christ alone. But his false sense of who he was prevented him from seeing what he needed. And that's why many people in our culture don't come to Jesus. Not because they don't believe in him. It's because they believe they're okay without him. In our confession, in our prayer book, there's a beautiful line that says, apart from your grace, there is no health in us. There is no health in us apart from God's grace. This passage is about God's grace. 
This passage is about understanding that we can't earn our salvation. That we have to come simply to on our knees before God and extend our hands and receive the free gift of salvation. That is what this passage is about. It's about knowing who Jesus is, knowing who you are, and how bad you and I need him. But often things come in the way, our own sense of who we are and how bad we are or how bad we're not. And that's another thing. Some people think about constantly, what must I do to please God? You cannot earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do to add or remove your place from God's kingdom outside of believing in his son. And then on the other end of the spectrum is those who are not even thinking about these things. They're not even concerned even about the 5 through 10, much less 1 through 4. So I speak to both people today. If you find yourself in one of those categories, we can often seek to receive God's approval or kindness or blessing by the things we do or because of who we think we are. And then there's another group of people that possibly might think that none of this stuff means anything or matters. When you come up to receive communion today, as the music is being played and our praise team is singing songs, as you're walking down this aisle, I want you to imagine Jesus on his way up the mountain. The mountain of Calvary. And when we hear songs of praise and joy and cheer, imagine what Jesus was hearing on his way up the mountain. Crucified, blasphemer. Why? Why do I ask you to imagine that? Because that's God's love for us. He walked the mountain we must have walked. He was nailed to the cross that we, if we're honest, deserve to be on. But he did it. We don't need to do it. I hope that moves you today in remembering God's great love and free gift of grace to you and to me. And if we're ready to leave everything behind, even our own sense of goodness. That is a lie. That is a great lie we deceive ourselves with. His goodness, his love for his people, he paid the ultimate price. This man, because of his earthly possessions and his self-understanding, which was false, prevented him from knowing the true God and following him. May we not let anything come in our way in receiving that great gift of salvation that was bought for us, that was satisfied for us. We have been redeemed by our Lord Lord, forgive us and thank you. Thank you, Lord. You are sufficient. Your word said this morning, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. 
may we come to you as a child and receive you as you are, full of grace and truth and goodness. In your name we pray. Amen.